think people are going to want to talk about this show. What? It's kind of obscure, isn't it? Game of this Thrones. one? Yeah, I don't yeah. know. I don't know if we'll have an audience for this one. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Polite Fight. If you're new to the show, I'm John Tatey, and I'm joined, as I always am, by Gus Spellman for a show where we sort of deconstruct, pick apart the cinematic storytelling of our favorite TV shows, concentrating on the, the visuals and the filmmaking and the sound design, the mm -hmm. all these little components that go into telling the story that you might not notice the first time through. And as you can imagine by the title, sometimes we fight cordially about our interpretations of the show. And we've traditionally, or the last two times we've done this show, we did it with shows that I think are considered a little more artful, maybe. Arty, yeah. And Game of Thrones has a reputation for being a little bit trashy. A little tawdry. And I think we're hoping to draw out some of the nice choices that the directors yeah. of these episodes There's are still making a lot to of elevate artistry the storytelling. Yeah. Our discussion is informed by, of course, our notes from watching the show, but we also uh, go into the reviews on avclub.com and grab some of the best comments to inform our discussions. Mm -hmm. We are here to talk about the sixth season premiere, which is entitled The Red Woman, and we'll get to her in a bit. I'm going to kick off by talking about this Arya fight scene, and I just want to talk about the editing of this scene. So Arya's in this fight, she's blind, she's struggling, and this fight has a certain rhythm where she gets battered for a mm -hmm. little bit and then she takes a breath. When she's getting smacked with this stick, we have these medium close-ups, mm -hmm. I call, but with the shaky cam, right? Yeah, like, yeah. So it feels like you're in the action. Punctuated with these longer shots, and these are shot with a still cam. It gives gives the viewer that sense of the rhythm of the fight. When you got the shaking cam, you're feeling disoriented, you're feeling mm -hmm. a little sick maybe, and then during these periods of rest, you have the still camera, so it allows you to really get into what Arya's experiencing mm -hmm. here. It's interesting, I have noticed the same things yeah. and came to the same conclusion but via a different route. So oh, I'll tell okay. you what yeah, I found, it, which is that these shots, and there's probably like, uh, I'll count it up for the viewers when I edit the video mm -hmm. together, but mm -hmm. I would say there's probably 20 different completely distinct angles. Not, you know, shots that they return to, but right. completely distinct angles. I think it gives you that sense of not being able to ground yourself in one perspective that you're seeing. Right, of literal disorientation yeah. in the sense that you do not have a point to orient yourself yes. toward. I think they do actually a great job in this whole sequence of communicating Arya's experience of mm -hmm. blindness. You know, it's a lot of shots that are very out of focus. The only thing that's in focus is her, and that applies to the people walking past her and then to the waif when she shows up. So I think that they do a really good job carrying that through the fight. You just get a really good sense of Arya's blindness. And then I love that it culminated in this shot where you have the, the big soldier statue in the background, and it sort of feels a little bit aspirational. You know, he's out of focus too, but that's where she Absolutely. wants to get to, that's where we want her to get to. People take Game of Thrones to task for not having a lot of nuance or subtlety, but I think that we can see that in the filmmaking there are there are moments like this that do a very good job communicating in a very unobtrusive visual cinematic way. And yeah. I think that's a lot of the reason why the show works for people even though the storytelling can be a little uneven or even trashy. You can be sophisticated without being subtle, and I think mm -hmm. this is a very sophisticated fight scene um, in terms of, like we've said, getting us into the feeling of the combatants. Um, let's talk about another fight scene in this uh, episode. You know, one of the most effective moments in the episode for me was this scene where uh, Sansa accepts Brienne into her service. Mm -hmm. And obviously it's powerful because it's the same speech that her mother gave to Brienne. But I think another reason that it works is the way that they lead up to it with this fight scene, which just sort of starts all at once, like Brienne just rides in, and it's a very complicated fight scene. You're following like four different characters plus all of their opponents. It's just like a lot going on. It just goes through until it's done, and then immediately they go into this very still, very soft scene where Sansa accepts Brienne, and I think that's what gives that scene its weight. It stands in such contrast to what they put before. So we have these two uh, drawn out fight scenes, or normal length fight scenes, and then we have the abbreviated fight scene that's cut short with a spear through the mm -hmm. head in Dorne, right? But I uh, want to go back a little bit in the Dorne storyline here and look at a different, more peaceful shot. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the cinematographers must love setting up these Dorne scenes, right? Because as opposed to sort of the 
cold, wintry realms mm -hmm. of the north or the sort of desert realm of the east. You, had, you just have this lush green. It's so full of color. So the director really uses the lush Dorn setting to his advantage here. I was caught by surprise despite myself. You should mm -hmm. always expect violence on Game of Thrones, but this is how good the show is mm -hmm. in catching you off guard. This is so placid. It looks like, you know, a Renaissance painting, this shot of Doran on the throne. And then we pivot so quickly to violence once mm -hmm. this message comes through that it, it's shocking. To me, what I noticed was how public it is. I feel like most of the times in Game of Thrones, an assassination scene like this, it's usually done in secret, right. or you know, maybe in a big crowd so that you can't tell who did it. You don't expect it because this feels like a very safe setting. There's literally guards there. The most shocking aspect of this scene is not so much the stabbing, but the lack of oh, action yeah, exactly. by all these brightly the colored guards mm -hmm. who we've already noticed. Their stasis adds to the sort of shock and confusion here, which is a great touch. Let's talk about a scene you know, Game of Thrones, I think almost every episode ev that I've ever watched of Game of Thrones, there's a few scenes where I'm watching and I'm like, anywhere from like, eh, to like, it feels geez, slack. this is not, yeah, not okay. working. Okay. And to me, that scene here was the Varys and Tyrion sequence as they're like strolling through the city. And even though they have like good one-liners against each other, it feels like very flat. So I, I'm curious, did this sequence work for you? No, I have the and same you feeling think? you did, and I actually do blame the performances, which may sound crazy, because these are these are two really talented actors here who I love. These mm -hmm. are two of my favorite characters, and I love when they have scenes together, but they're just chemistry isn't there. You walk like a rich person. You've spent a lot of time studying the way rich people walk. You walk as though the paving stones were your personal property. You know, maybe it's that the way that they shoot this scene is just this one long shot, and they're sort of more interested in giving you the surroundings of what it's like down in, uh, down, right. down in, in Marine, in yeah. Marine, instead of you know relying on being able to cut to Tyrion's expression when he's making fun of Varys. Like I think that's where you really get the good relationships Great between point. them. And I think this is a case where you see. Game of Thrones is like, well, we've got to give people a sense for what the lower class part of this city is like. And so we can't focus on these two guys. I think that that's maybe why it doesn't I work I think for you're me. right. I think in this scene, conceptually, the figure and ground are almost swapped, where the background is the more important thing. But there is some good, we talked before taping, there are some good shots in this sequence mm -hmm. when you can see that they're sort of being watched, especially this shot here. I just think it's like very eloquent. It feels dangerous. They're both got, under these spikes. Yeah, these, these swords of spikes. Damocles yeah, hanging yeah. over each of them. The other thing about this shot is they're each in their own box. They're mm -hmm. separated, which gave me pause. It does feel like this may portend some split between the two of them. Yeah. All right, well, let's talk about the thing that everybody's talking about with this okay. episode, we'll the, close Red with Woman. the Red Woman. I have some comments here about it. We've got Dan the King of Sock Monkeys. Uh, <laughs> I hope to God that had something to do with the plot in reference to her taking her nudity. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then Tecumseh responding, it wasn't just random nudity for the sake of random nudity, but random symbolic nudity for the sake of sim random symbolic nudity. Mm. So there's this, always this debate about whether the nudity is just there for nudity's sake, right? And I actually think that's a valuable debate to have, but if you look for a reason for it, as Tecumseh has with his comment, um, maybe you'll find something. Maybe mm -hmm. you'll uncover something that you didn't think about when you were just struck by, oh, there's a naked person on the screen right now. So the, I mean, the nudity does get at her stripping away all of her trappings, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. I, like I don't think this is gratuitous. For me, gratuitous is something that has no narrative Nothing. purpose whatsoever. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's not entirely necessary, which mm -hmm. to me is a different thing from gratuitous, but go ahead. Well, I mean, to me, I think it can be more than just of course. nudity, but also, but still be gratuitous. I'll be curious to see what you, what you think once I've made my little uh, okay. break down yeah. here. I think that they play with the light on her face sort of throughout the episode to articulate this. You know, when she comes in, she's lit in red, you know, the red woman we've always seen. But then when she sees Jon Snow's body dead for the first time, you get a tint of blue coming in yeah. On, yeah. Her, on her person. And then 
Later in this scene where she disrobes, she's sitting by the fire and you can see the same dynamic playing out on her hands. You've got the flame in the background and the cold blue. When she comes over to the mirror here, it's no longer like half and half blue and red. She it's, doesn't look red at all. Right, she's now totally cold and they have her surrounded by this brass candlestick and this candle over here right. to highlight how cold she seems. I thought that was a nice way to communicate what's going on in her mind. Now whether she needed to get naked to communicate that or not is up for debate. I think they certainly use it. Like the more skin you show, the bluer she is. It does illustrate how she is really casting off something real here. And I don't think it would feel the same if she kept all her red clothes yes. on. I think you're right. Yeah, I think you're right. Well, uh, that wraps it up for the season premiere of Game of Thrones. Thank you, as always, for Gus Spellman. I'm John Tatey. So long for now. Bye, guys. <laughs>